In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. My brothers and sisters, uh, welcome to our study of the Sunday readings. Today we're going to look at the readings for the Feast of the Holy Family of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. So we start off with our very first reading, and as you go through this first reading from Ben Sirah or Sirach, uh, you're going to notice that it really underlines uh, the importance of father, a mother, respecting, loving our father and mother, being patient with them. There's a lot of good advice here that we can share with families, uh, especially to encourage our families to pray together, encouraging our families to, uh, in, to walk together in Christ. When was this book written? Uh, it was probably written around 200 BC to a 180 BC. Uh, and then around 132 BC, it was translated by Ben Sira's grandson. And that's where we get the Greek version. Uh, for many years, there's a long history, but for many years, we did not have the Hebrew version of Ben Sira. And many scholars doubted that it even existed. Uh, then in the late 1890s, we began to actually discover Hebrew manuscripts in a, a synagogue in Cairo and the Genisa, which was a, like a manuscript depository uh, for the synagogue in Cairo. Right around 1896, we discovered a number of manuscripts. And then later, other manuscripts were discovered in Qumran, also in Masada. Um, and so uh, let's talk about Ben Sira here. This is written in the Second Temple period. Okay, the period after the second temple uh, was dedicated uh, before our Lord Jesus came. So let's see what he says here in chapter three. God sets a father in honor over his children. A mother's authority he confirms over her sons. Now, uh, you find this very type of teaching in the book of Proverbs. If you read Proverbs very closely, You'll see how the book over and over again tells a son who seeks wisdom to listen to their father and their mother. Uh, and so this is something that you can say to your people. You can say, if you seek wisdom, you will acknowledge your mother and your father's authority. And it goes on and it says, whoever honors his father atones for sins and preserves himself from them. So what is Ben Sir getting at here? Well, number one, in the Second Temple period, we have to remember that it wasn't just sacrifice, but actually your sacrifices had to correspond with your conduct. So you could bring all the sacrifices to the temple. You could, you know, celebrate Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. But if you were not really living the faith, you were really living a contradiction. So... The idea here is that your sacrifices also complement your conduct. And, and that's something that even to this day, it's a principle we can follow. Um, and also, if a son or daughter, they, if they honor their father, they will preserve themselves from sin because they're going to avoid falling into sin. And then it goes on and it repeats this phrase, when he prays, he is heard. When he prays, uh, when he prays, he is heard. So the idea is that your life is conformed to the covenant relationship. The sacrifices that you offer, they reflect the life of faith that you're living. And because of that, your prayer is heard. God hears the prayer of a righteous person. And you see that especially uh, underlined if you go to the book of 1 Kings chapter 18, the famous battle of the prophets when Elijah prays to God and fire comes down from heaven. You see a similar example in Exodus chapter 15, 22 to 26, when Moses prays for Israel. Also Exodus chapter 17, verses one through seven. Those are some examples of a righteous person's prayer being heard right away. Uh, and so it goes on and it says that uh, the person who who honors his father. He atones for sin. He preserves himself from sin. He won't fall in those sins. His prayer is heard. He stores up riches. He who stores up riches reveres his mother. So this kind of follows a similar idea that you find in Proverbs, you know, where 
you know, the, where good conduct is like storing up riches. And Jesus actually builds on this in the New Testament when he talks about having treasure in heaven, making Christ our treasure. Uh, so whoever honors his father, he's gladdened by children. Children are a gift from God. And in the, throughout the entire Old Testament, fertility was always seen as a gift. And we live in a culture that does not respect the gift of fertility. And it's something that we want to share with our people. We want to talk about fertility as a gift, as a blessing, especially young couples and families. We want to urge them to see the blessing in fertility. And what a blessing it is when our families are open to life and they have many children and they're blessed with so much joy. So we see a lot of young couples who are beginning to realize this even this day. It goes on and it says, whoever reveres his father will live a long life. This was a promise. If you go all the way you know, back to uh, Exodus chapter 20. And if you remember uh, when Moses gave the commandments, of course, the fourth commandment was to honor your mother and your father. Okay. And let's see if we can find it right here. Okay, honor your honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. So it's like God was saying, if you honor your mother and father, your days are going to be pro prolonged. You're going to have a long life in that land that I'm giving you, in that inheritance that I'm giving you. That's you can go you can see that in Exodus chapter 20 verse 12, okay? So now we go back to our text right now, okay? And so he who obeys his father brings comfort to his mother. So in other words, there's going to be unity in the family. We want to work for unity in our families. So it goes on, it says, my son, take care of your father when he is old. Grieve him not uh, as long as he lives. Even if his mind fails, be considerate with him. Revile him not all the days of his life. So it's it's uh, encouraging a son and a daughter to be patient with their parents. And, you know, one thing we might note is that today people live longer. You know, we have medicine that can help the body live longer, but often the mind is not as good. And what that means is that we have to be patient with our parents. We, we have to recognize when they're getting old. You know, we have to recognize when they're getting weak. And we simply have to have patience with them. Um, and so a lot of families struggle with this. You know, they, their parents, their mother, their father is, is growing old and it's, it's much more difficult. And we just have to be able to endure a little bit. He goes on and he says, kindness to a father will not be forgotten. Firmly planted against the debt, against the debt of your sin a house raised in justice to you. So Ben Sear is basically saying, you know, look, look at this kindness that you showed to your parents. It's never going to be forgotten. May that be a motivation to you to be good to your parents. So I want to encourage all of you out there who are caring for parents, be patient. Let's go to our next reading. So we have a lot of options this weekend. We can also take the reading from Genesis chapter 15. This is the famous reading where God promised Abraham that he would have an heir. And if you remember in Genesis chapter 15, the Lord told Abraham to look at the stars in heaven. And he said, so will your descendants be. And Abraham had faith in God's promise and God considered it righteous. He considered Abraham to be righteous. So it says that Abraham put his faith in the Lord who credited it to him as an act of righteousness. In the New Testament, Paul underlines the importance of this action. If you go to Romans chapters 3 and 4, and he talks about how, look at how Abraham was considered to be righteous because of his faith that he had in the Lord. It was, it was a living faith that he had as well. And he underlines how we must have faith in Christ, that righteousness does not come through the works of the law, but it comes through faith in Christ our Lord. So Paul picks up on this point uh, in, uh, the, in the book of Genesis. And then what's really interesting is we have two chapters here. So we have a little reading from Genesis 15 and another one from Genesis 21 all together. So the second part of the Genesis reading, it says here that 
The Lord took note of Sarah as he had said he would. He did for her as he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time that God had stated. And Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son of, son of his uh, of his whom Sarah bore him. Now, why would the church take a reading six chapters later and put it together? And the reason is very simple. In Genesis 15, you have the promise made to Abram. And then in Genesis 21, you have the fulfillment of that promise. And the point is very simple. Between that time, Ab Abraham and Sarah went through great trials, but God fulfilled his promise. In other words, be faithful. Every family is going to go through great trials. Be faithful during those times in the midst of those great trials and know that God will fulfill his promise to give us eternal life in Christ. We go now to the responsorial Psalm, Psalm 28, 128. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways, for you shall eat the fruit of your handiwork. Blessed shall you be favored. Notice how this blessing is tied to fearing the Lord. Having the fear for the Lord, fear of the Lord is having an awesome reverence for the Lord. It's a desire to avoid every form of sin, to turn away from every form of sin. If someone has the fear of the Lord, they will not persist in sin willingly, but they will begin to make an effort to turn away, to repent, and to return to our Lord. It goes on, your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the recesses of your home, your children like all of plants around your table. Now, fertility is one of the great blessings that you see in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. In that very same section where it talks about how God created man and women in his own divine image and likeness. It also underlines the very first command given to the human race, be fruitful and multiply. It's a blessing and a command given at the same time, the blessing of fertility. And so over and over again in the Hebrew scriptures, the blessing of fertility is seen as a sign of God's blessing. Oh, how we pray that our families could see this to this day. Um, your wife will be like a fruitful vine in the recesses of your home. How they would rejoice in their children and thank God for his blessing. This is something that, that needs to be prayed about. It needs to be shared. Many, many parents, unfortunately, don't see this. Behold, thus is the man blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem. So we go on here and we have a, another responsorial psalm. You can choose Psalm 105. I'm not going to go through the whole psalm because there's so many readings this week. But once again, you have another great psalm. And what's beautiful about this psalm is it says, Your descent, You descendants of Abraham, his servants, sons of Jacob, his, his holy ones. He, the Lord, is our God throughout the earth, his judgments Prevail. So Psalm 128, it really underlines the blessing of God in the family. And Psalm 105, it's looking at the spiritual family of Israel. And, you know, while we talk about the holy family, you know, you can also talk about the spiritual family of the church and how each family is like a little domestic church. And then as a family, we must get involved in our church. We must serve the Lord together. So these are things that we want to talk about this week. Maybe we can share them with people this week. I want to motivate the families out there to go out of the way to bring family members back to church. So it goes on. It says, he remembers forever his covenant, which he made binding for a thousand generations, which he entered into with Abraham and by his oath to Isaac. So you see how Psalm 105, it echoes that second reading. Okay, now let's go to go to the um, other choices we have here for the second reading. So 
We have one from Colossians here, St. Paul to the Colossians. Brothers and sisters, put on as God's, cho as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Notice what he tells them to put on. It's like you're putting on a garment. Put on heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. Notice this garment that he's telling us to put on. All these virtues of faith, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. Why is Paul bringing this up to the Colossians? Because he wants the church to be united as a family of faith. You get the idea. If one has a grievance against another, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also do. Forgiveness is not optional. Jesus makes this very clear. If you go to Matthew's gospel, for instance, just go to Matthew, go to Matthew chapter 5, right around verse 14, okay? So we're going to take a look here, 5 verse 14, and look what, look what Matthew says here, okay? Actually, start in verse, let's see what verse it is. Well, maybe not, okay? I'll have to go find the verse later, but he basically says that we have to forgive one another. He makes this very clear that we must forgive one another. It must be chapter six. That's what I'm, that's what I'm looking for here, chapter six. Right after um, teaching the Our Father, he says in chapter six, verse 14, if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your father will not forgive your transgressions. Now, does that sound optional or does that sound like an obligation? Well, if you said obligation, you're right. It's not optional. We are required to forgive others because we have been forgiven in Christ and we must graciously forgive others. Now, if we have that attitude, if we really say, wow, we, we must forgive others, and the reason is very simple, because Christ has forgiven us. It'll be easy to forgive, because you will always be thinking of the sacrifice that Jesus offered for you. But if you are not conscious of that, if you are not grateful for, for what Christ has done, it will always be difficult to forgive. So uh, Paul explains it in a very beautiful way, you know, that bearing with one another, forgiving one another, um, and as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also do. It, it's always a reflection on what Christ has done for us. Once we become very heartfelt, grateful for what Jesus has done for us, it becomes easy to forgive. But if we, if we really don't think about what Christ has done, if we don't really consider it daily, it'll be difficult, very difficult to forgive. And he goes above, he goes over all these things, put on love. Once again, like it's a garment. That is the bond of perfection. And he goes on and he says, let the peace of Christ control your hearts. You know, the old saying when uh, you were teenagers, your friend would jump in the car and say, let me ride shotgun. Okay, you're driving. Uh, let the peace of Christ control your hearts. Let Christ direct your life. Let it be the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ knows Jesus' forgiveness. It's different than the world's concept of peace. The peace into which you were also called in one body and be thankful. So he's talking about the church. The unity of the church is one body in Christ. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. We should be meditating on the gospels, reading them every day. As in all wisdom, you teach and admonish one another. What do we call that? We call that fraternal uh, correction. Of course, a lot of times fraternal correction is not fraternal. That's the big problem. It must be fraternal with charity, with love, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of Jesus. You're doing it for Christ. You're doing it to to represent his love, to help other people know his love, do everything in his name so that they can know the very person of Christ. Now, where does that come from? 
Well, if, if you go back to the book of Deuteronomy, the Lord talks about the place where he will make his name known. Uh, that was where the tabernacle resided, where the temple was, the very place where God dwelt in the midst of his people, where he made himself known to Israel and to all who came to worship at that place. It goes back to that concept. And here, Paul is underlining that we have been sent out into the world. Now we do everything in the name of Christ so that others can know Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So he goes on, he says, wives, be subordinate to your husbands as is proper in the Lord. Well, this is a great scripture reading right here. Why? You're probably saying, why is it great? Because as Catholics, you have to read scripture in context. Without context, you will have a pretext. And if you go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, you see where Paul talks about the entire church being mutually submissive to one another. And then he talks about the respective roles of husband and wife. And so you have we have to read this along with Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 and onward. Paul underlines how wives and husbands, they, they are a living example of the love between Christ and his church. And so when they give themselves completely to each other, putting themselves even under one another, they're imitating that love between Christ and his church. And so Paul goes on and he says, husbands, love your wives and avoid any bitterness towards them. Avoid arguments, avoid bitterness. Children, obey your parents in everything for this is pleasing to the Lord. And this was my favorite line as a child, fathers do not provoke your children so they may not become discouraged. I liked that one when I was young. So parents be careful careful not to provoke your children. Build them up. Help them to see their potential. Help them to know what God wants them to do and that each one of them has an important role and an important plan. God has something in store for each one of us. We just have to say yes to his will and we will discover it. Okay, well, we have another reading from Hebrews chapter 11. This is the famous reading that talks about the faith of all those incredible, incredible Old Testament saints. Uh, and it just underlines the faith of Abraham uh, and how he was put to the test and he offered up his son, Isaac. Um, and it says that he had received the, pro he, it says that by faith, Abraham, when put to the test, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was ready to offer his only son of whom it was said, through Isaac, through Isaac, descendants shall bear your name. He reasoned that God was able to raise Eve, even from the dead, and he received Isaac back as a symbol, an incredible event. Genesis chapter 22. So Hebrews chapter 11, it underlines the importance of the faith of all those Old Testament saints. You might want to talk about you know, in this reading, how families need to have faith. That's what keeps a family together, faith. Okay, now we go to our, uh, finally to our gospel reading. Uh, and it says here in this gospel reading, it says, when the days were completed for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they took him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. It would have been 40 days. If you go to Leviticus chapter 12, the book of Leviticus often talks about ritual sin. It's actually not a moral sin in the way that we think of a sin. It simply means that in some ritual way, you could not participate in temple ceremony. So if a certain bodily fluids left the body, you could be rendered ritually unclean, not morally, but ritually. So blood, because blood was associated with life, a lot of biblical scholars think that it's fluids like blood and semen that are associated with life that could render a man or a woman unclean. Um, and so that's at least the theory. So because blood was associated with life and, and, a, and when a woman gave birth to a son, she was ritually unclean for a period of 40 days. Isn't that interesting? We still even have this today in a lot of places in Latin America where a child is um, brought to the church after 40 days during the presentation, not with the exact same meaning. During this time, 
you were you, you were in a state of ritual impurity for 40 days and then after 40 days that child was brought and presented before the Lord. Also, Exodus 13 talks about how every firstborn is dedicated to the Lord. It goes back to the Passover when those firstborn were redeemed by the blood of the Passover lamb. And for that reason, because they were redeemed by the blood of the Passover lamb, every male that opened the womb was consecrated to the Lord. Okay. And, and so what sacrifices were offered? Okay. Normally you would offer a lamb and a turtle dove. However, if you were poor, you would offer two turtle doves or two young pigeons. So guess what sacrifice Mary and Joseph brought? Do you think they brought a lamb and a turtle dove? No. They brought, a, they brought two young pigeons, okay? And why is that? A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons? Why did they do that? Because it underlines that they, they were not economically doing very well. So they were able to bring a, you know, a lesser sacrifice. So in accordance with the dictate of the law of the Lord, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout. Luke uh, uses this phrase, he describes Zechariah as being righteous in Luke chapter 1. He describes Simeon as being righteous. This is a very, um, a very lofty description. He was righteous and devout. Notice that it's the man who's righteous and devout, who's waiting for the consolation of Israel. He's the one who recognizes the Messiah. Most people did not recognize the Christ. It tells us something about how we should live in the midst of our generation. He was righteous and devout, awaiting the consolation of Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Christ of the Lord. Now, look at how St. Luke underlines the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of individuals. Luke wants us to see how the Holy Spirit can work in our life as well. He wants us to open up our lives completely to the work of the Holy Spirit so that we live a, a life that is righteous and devout, always waiting for Jesus to return. So what happens? He came, he came in the Spirit into the temple. He's guided by the Holy Spirit to the temple. Can you imagine? This is amazing. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform the custom of the law in regard to him, he took into his he took him into his arms and blessed God. So he simply just knew with the help of the Holy Spirit, this is the consolation of Israel. This is the Christ. Now, where does that phrase consolation of Israel come from? You're probably wondering where it comes from. It probably comes from uh, Isaiah chapter 40 verse 1. It's a very special section in Isaiah where God tells his people comfort, comfort, consolation, consolation. So it could be related to that section in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 1, which begins a new section in the book of Isaiah. It's often referred to as Deutero Isaiah or second Isaiah as well. So Simeon lifts up the Christ child and he gives thanks to God, okay? Uh, and so let's go back here. And he says these words, look at the words that he says. These are words that we say when we pray evening prayer. Now, master, you may let your servant go in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all the peoples, a light for the revelation of the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. The child's father and mother were amazed at what was said about him. Now, the thing that I really want to say here is that, you know, what makes the Holy Family holy is that you have Mary, you have Joseph, and you have Jesus in the midst of the Holy Family. You have two saints and you have Christ in the presence of the Holy Family. And this is what we want to strive for. We want to strive to live lives of holiness in the presence of Christ. And, and so that our Lord would always be known in our families. We want to be guided by the Holy Spirit so that we could always do his will. So it goes on and it says that Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother. Notice what he says only to Mary, not to Joseph, only to Mary. you got to point that out. 
and of course, you know that Joseph is not present at the cross. He probably would have died by that time. But it goes on and, and look at what Simeon says. Behold, this child.